Hello, everyone. Um, this is going to be a, uh, an invited talk in a, in a couple of minutes. So uh, please hang on until our scheduled time. Uh, I already posted the uh, Neurostar link for questions should be overflow. Um, I'll start the formal introduction uh, right on the hour. Well, I probably won't have to type during the talk, so we're fine. Um, well, I see the attendees still coming up in numbers, so we'll wait that minute. And maybe in the last 40 seconds before we officially start, I would actually want to take the opportunity to thank the organizers, uh, the webmaster who's doing really extra time for this event. Um, that's really free for everyone. Um, and also, of course, our president, Volker Stoiber of OCNS and, uh, and the program committee and the board. Um, if some of you are listening are new to CNS meetings, uh, some of us have been here for well over 20 years. Um, there are opportunities to serve on the board of directors and on the program committee. Uh, so if this meeting catches your attention and you want to see us all in person sometime and participate, please do not be shy to email Volker Stoiber or myself or Thomas Nowotny, someone else, and uh, express your interest in, in joining us as, as a society. We are, uh, we are always up for new, new blood, so to speak, and we're not sucking it up either. So um, all friendly. Now it's uh, three o'clock, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the next uh, key speaker. We've had the ground rules. Um, so questions should be asked in the Ask a Question tab. Um, of course, if you have a, a link to, ch to, to share or something that's, uh, that may be of interest to others, uh, use the chat. Uh, also, don't forget, if you're not asking a question, but if you scan the question every once in a while and vote for your favorite question, uh, those votes will ultimately determine which questions we get a chance to, to ask in, in this session. Uh, there will be only limited opportunity for that. Now, for everyone else who we don't get to answer uh, immediately, there's another Q&A session in seven hours from now. Uh, that's right after the poster session uh, back in, uh, in Crowdcast. And uh, there we can actually let you come on stage, ask the questions. We have a whole hour to in a more leisurely way, uh, still answer more questions. So please attend even after the poster session. Please just check in with us if you find this uh, an, an enticing presentation to chat about. And I think it will be a very interesting presentation. So let me introduce uh, the speaker, Daniel Polani, who actually grew up in Germany, uh, in Mainz, and then also went to the University of Mainz for a PhD in mathematics and computer science. Um, then he was a research fellow both in Mainz and Lübeck uh, before he got a position as a lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire in England. Um, there he went through the, uh, the ranks, uh, first as lecturer, then reader, then professor. And uh, most of you know that that is sort of in the American sense that would be assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor. Since 2018, he's also been the director of the Center for Computer Science and Informatics Research at University of Hertfordshire, as well as the head of the Adaptive Systems Research Group. Um, now, his research program is an interest in self-organization, uh, complex systems, and multi-agent systems. Um, he's an editor of the Journal of Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems uh, man, uh, Journal. Uh, he has over 180 publications. Um, 
And one thing that I personally find most intriguing is that he has been associated with the RoboCup uh, uh, competition for many, many years, and he was also the president of the RoboCup uh, uh, Federation for three years, uh, from 2017 through 2019. And I will in a moment uh, post the, uh, the link to the RoboCup so that you can figure out what that is. And that is when multi-agent systems actually have to work in unison uh, to play uh, robot soccer. And, and, uh, and even, even today, this does not quite look like human soccer. And while uh, uh, they beat us in chess and, and go, uh, they, they do not beat us yet in soccer. But uh, so there's ample research opportunities to figure out how to make uh, robots smarter in a real life scenario. So uh, without further ado, uh, Danielle will talk to our, us about information and decision making. Uh, please take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me? I don't get feedback. Sounds good. Sounds good. OK, so I'm going to talk about information and decision making and where the word information is important. It is Shannon information we are talking about. There are many other concepts of information, but Shannon information is the one we intend to uh, discuss. Now, I would like to give my acknowledgments to several European projects that have helped funding uh, this uh, work, uh, Corbis, uh, SOC SMCS, uh, we must, and quite a few more, in fact, but these are the most prominent ones. And uh, I also would like to uh, it's quite slow. Uh, think a large number of people. Well, the, the reaction time is a little bit slow. I would like to uh, thank a, quite a number of people uh, that have been involved in this research over the last roughly 20 years now. And um, basically, without them, all this would not have happened. And so everyone has had their part in building up this building, this cathedral of understanding that we are moving towards uh, in these days. But since I have a lot to talk to, I'll move straight to the topic. Now, Matt, uh, two days ago, actually said something that I really liked, and I'm citing him here. For a scientist, understanding is the coin of the realm. And we will talk about understanding. So the systems I'm going to talk about are usually quite small. They're quite minimalistic, but it does not change the fact that we are trying to understand principles and concepts rather than um, trying to understand, uh, trying to make a large system scale and somehow work. We want to understand. And everything I'm talking about has not a limitation in principle on the scaling or the level it is applied to. So the scaling is a practical problem, but it's not a conceptual one. I'm interested in this talk in conceptual questions. About the scaling, where there are things we can discuss, we can, I'm also happy to discuss during our uh, question hour. So this is the motivation that I am coming from. So originally, actually, I was motivated by biology. Um, retroactively, the question was, how did cognition evolve in biology? But truly, the real question that occupied me then was how sensors evolve in biology. So how would evolution know that a particular sensoric channel would be interesting and worth evolving? How would biology know that, for example, if you are a bat, trying to extract ultrasound and trying to create ultrasound to create reflections is a useful way to elicit information from your environment. And there are many more, magnetic sense, electrical sense, even the optical sense is not obvious how it would evolve. And we do know that, uh, for example, photoreceptors seem to have evolved in four to six different independent um, um, origins. And there seems to be 40 to 60 different lines of descent, but the independent origin seems to be four to six in photoreceptors. Now, as you look at that, you discover that sensors that you find in nature are often highly optimized. In fact, so highly optimized that you, it's, there, there's no obvious reason why it should be the case. So some sensors are actually operating at the physical limit. There are totes whose eyes can detect individual photons. 
And um, it seems that uh, little children can, for example, hear sound at the level of the signal to noise limit generated by the heat, by, by thermal, thermal noise. Of course, once uh, you go into a, a disco for the first time, that's over. But of course, um, uh, when young children have a very, very refined sense um, um, level of, of auditory sense. And there seems to be an evolutionary pressure for high cognitive functions when that is available, when, when, the, when the space is available or when, when the environment permits it. So my favorite animal um, in this uh, case, uh, to, to make the case, uh, are actually octopuses who are separated from us by around 400 million years of evolutionary history and have a completely different body plan, but their intellectual capacity is very, very high and competes with higher mammals. Um, I heard the number that it may be competing with cats. It's not, not exactly clear. They are clearly different brains, but they have, they have very high intellectual capacity. And this comes despite, as um, Xiaoping has very clearly explained yesterday, cognitive processing being very, very expensive. So expensive means if you look at the brain, that's kind of in rest 20% of your metabolism. When it's working hard, it's 50 to 40 to 50%. Um, even in the fly, when you look at the eye, the eye of a fly, which is large part of the brain effectively for a fly, for a house fly, that uses up 20% of the metabolism. So it's very clear that the motto in nature is capture all information you can get. Of course, it's not all you can afford to get. The information you get must be worth the metabolic expenditure that you uh, put into it. So you must get information that you can actually uh, support energetically. So information is the key and that's why we talk about information theory in the sense of shannon and i want to give you a slightly different motivation from the ones that usually are given and that is a well-known statistical test is a so-called nyman pearson test so basically you have two hypotheses p1 and p2 and you observe var um, x1 x2 and so on so on so on uh, xn of a very random variable and essentially the test consists of asking whether the probability for the, under the hypothesis P1 divided by the probability under the hypothesis P2 are above a certain threshold. Um, it sounds very trivial, but it turns out mathematical that this is a maximally powerful test. So if you want to reduce the number of false positives, you will increase the number of false negatives and vice versa. So it's a, it's a good test. It's, it's, it is a special test with good quality. But what interests us is the fact that we can play around with it a bit. Namely, we can take the events X as IID. Let's assume they are just IID. And then basically these probabilities become products. And we take the logarithm. So essentially the test becomes a sum of probability quotients and their logarithms. So we take the logarithms P1 divided by P2 over all the samples you observe. And when that exceeds K, your P1 hypothesis has been accepted. So it means that I can now ask, what's the average evidence growth per sample? Evidence in favor of P1 against P2. Because when this evidence exceeds threshold K, we accept. So if we look at this average, and in general, we would write it like this, where we see this is the average, uh, the, the probability, the true probability, as opposed to the hypotheses probabilities, which do not have to be the same as P. If now P1 is really the true hypothesis, um, the, the true probability, then this just reduces to the very well-known kullback leibler divergence between the, prob uh, the probabilities. So in other words, this kullback leibler distance between the divergence between the probabilities is an indicator how much evidence in favor of p1 with respect to p2 you get you can play the game in, um, opposite in the opposite direction so in p2 versus p1 but you see that essentially if i accumulate this evidence per time the more this is the larger this is the faster i accumulate evidence in favor 
of P1. The faster I accumulate it, and therefore the faster I will cross the threshold by at which I make the decision, yes, I accept the hypothesis. And decisions is what we are talking about. So decisions are the thing that we are interested in to um, uh, in the end of the day, because all an agent has, as much information as it takes in, millions of, of bytes or bits per second, um, uh, even larger memory possibly, but actions are very low bandwidth. So this is basically what makes our decision. This evidence, once it crosses the threshold, is the point at which we switch, and therefore information is the coin of the realm in decision making. So I'll give it now a very high level view, and then I'll zoom in as we proceed with the talk. So information theory. Information theory is essentially uh, born by the theory of communication. And funnily enough, it was actually born by Shannon claiming that the data that you communicate is completely without semantics. Of course, that's exactly the opposite of what an organism needs. It turns out that can be fi fixed. We can fix information theory an organism wants. In the next step, uh, we look at metrics for probabilities. Suddenly, probabilities, basically, they are objects that live on some possibly unstructured spaces. In the best case, you have a sigma algebra. If in discrete case, um, case you do not have any structure in the space a priori. Um, but on the probabilities themselves, you suddenly get a very complex and very interesting structure. This is well known as information geometry. And so information theory gives a well value to probabilities and endows them with the probability space with a lot of structure. One of the things you can, of course, show is that um, base is optimal in terms of information and a very specific te uh, term. So in a certain way, base gets you the most out of whatever evidence you have and whatever likelihood you have. Ray distortion theory is very important when you have to compromise, when you do not have the capacity to do everything or transmit all information you would like to transmit, you have to make compromises. What's the best compromise you can do? It depends on the distortion cost. We'll come back that, to that later, because it's the way to actually endow information with semantics, namely by the distortion, or as we'll see later, value, in fact. Um, now we're coming to the organisms. The organisms need to acquire information via the sensors. They need to process information. And ultimately, they imprint information. This is action. Action is not often seen as an information transmission process unless it's about communication, but it's not true. Whenever your agent impinges on the environment, it does pro produce information that is being sent to the environment. And Finally, one reason to look at information theory, it's not the last reason, there are many more, I could make this list uh, twice or three times as long, um, limits and invariants. Information theory gives you statements about what you possibly can do under certain given limitations of your informational channel. And with this, we'll start. We'll talk about that in, in detail in, in a second. Now. The original view of information, and Shannon has been quite adamant about that, was communication. People very early tried to make information work to understand intelligence. Um, we'll talk later about an attempt by Ashby, uh, actually one of the few successful attempts, but essentially the first 50 years of information uh, theory went so by so unsuccessfully that, in fact, at some point, Gibson uh, claimed information theory is not relevant to understanding agents because the world is not intending to speak to us. And I will add, it's also not uh, designed to listen to us. So there is nobody there that takes responsibility for encoding a message to us. That's the view that actually Gibson had after seeing all these unsuccessful attempts of making information theory useful. Um, today we know better. We do not need intentional encoding or decoding by the world only by the agent. It is enough if the agent, or essentially evolution through the, out, through the agent, has made sure that encoding and decoding takes place. So what do I mean by this? The standard view of information theory is there's a sender, you encode your message suitably, 
I'm not going to talk about channel, uh, um, source and channel uh, coding. It's not really important here. Um, there's a channel, there's a noise in the channel that you decode and you get a receiver. Now, in organisms, you basically have two channels. This is the first one. You have a world. There's a physics that is given. It's a priori. It's not evolving, in fact. What's evolving is a sensor, and the sensor reads out the physics. This is um, basically uh, uh, gets information from the world. Now it's decoded because the brain can do that. It's, it's, it's allowed to, to do processing and complex and non-trivial processing and gets this information from the world. And vice versa, the mirror image of that is, of course, you encode whatever you decide to do into the actuator and via physics, this impinges on the world. Not a big surprise, but it's clear that here we have some kind of analogy to the Shannon communication channel. So the consequence is it's a model agnostic, coherent and universal language to study. Information acquisition, processing and action. What do I mean by model agnostic? It doesn't mean that you should not use a model. Of course, when you use a neural network, if you use a classifier system, if you use a tabular, tabular, uh, tabular uh, action, uh, action uh, mapping, these are particular models, but you know precisely where the model assumption goes in. So you know you can control exactly what your assumptions are when you do information theory. If you say, I need to solve this problem, you know how much information that needs, and that does not depend on what particular model you decide upon. So let's start with a very simple example, um, an overview of the type of models we're going to consider. So if you have a Markovian world, so the world is a random variable, time t minus 3, t minus 2, t minus 1, and the time proceeds from the left to the right. This is unstructured, there's, there's nothing in the world. There, there's just a big blob. And there may be substructures, but we don't see them, we don't care about them. Then we'll start talking about agents. And uh, we, uh, the simplest agent we can imagine is a blind agent, an open loop agent. So the agent is something that has a fixed policy that does not depend on the world state. And this policy is modifying the world. Now, in the background of having such an agent, we always think of evolution, OK? I'm not going to talk about it a lot. Um, think of it as an extremely slow changing learning process. For the purposes of our talk, it does not change at all. But of course, it is optimal in some suitable sense. So this is optimizing probably something or being, being uh, surviving, um, being viable. It doesn't have to be optimal. We know evolution doesn't require optimality, it just requires viability. Whatever it is, this is somehow selected for and I will not further discuss about the process that does, does this in detail. Now, this is an open loop agent. The policy is the same everywhere. And if I introduce a sensor, um, and now the sensor is generic in the sense that it can, in principle, access everything it wants in the world. And this is the next level of refinement that we're going to consider. In reality, it will not look at everything in the world. But if we could, then we would pick out the things that make a difference. And more specifically, we can go to a reactive agent that has dedicated sensors. This means the sensors have been already optimized, pre-optimized. They are sensors that have a very particular um, structure that may have emerged by evolution. And the most sophisticated model is the one where we look at memory. Um, so M stands for memory. Think of it as a brain, because this arrow here includes the processing in the brain. It's a very simple model for discrete time, but in principle, you can model any arbitrarily complex discrete time system with this model. I did not say how many states you have in M. It could be a continuous world. It could be discrete. It could be counter set. You choose. So we have the world. We have the sensor. We have the memory, which is affected by the sensor. And what was in the memory previously? We have an action. And the action, together with the last world state, creates a new world state. This is to be read as a Bayesian network. And what I want to point out here is the symmetry. Not only is it almost symmetric with respect to time, except for the time error, of course. The time error, of course, has a direction. But what's more striking is, with respect to this boundary, uh, the perception action loop is actually almost perfectly symmetric. And the only thing 
that distinguishes the world and the agent is the fact that the agent can choose its arrows, the world cannot. The world is a passive physical system. So it's essentially this one is actually adaptive, this one is not. This is the symmetry breaker. Evolution is a symmetry breaker in this picture. So let us revisit this. It gets more interesting, right? I mean, I put in here these rewards, but I can now ask the following question. I can, for example, ask the typical question of MDP. In an MDP, what you say is, okay, um, I get sensory information and I make a decision. I get this information, process it, and take a decision. And for now, let's forget about the the memory retainment, I will look at the reactive agent, so I, I simplify my picture. If I look at this, this is what we will call later relevant information. It is how much information do I need from the sensor to pick an action at the desired quality level. So this is a very natural question to ask. But when we look at this diagram, the next thing we can look at is, well, there's a, uh, there's a mirror image to that question. There's a dual question. And that dual so when we look at this one, this is pull information. How much information do I need to pull from the environment? I can, of course, look at the dual question, which is the push information. So it is basically just a consequence of the symmetry. If I push information to the world, what comes back? Now, you would ask, why do I care? Well, I hope I can convince you later that you should care, and it's worth caring about. So the information theoretical picture that I have information getting from the environment, or I can push information to the environment, gives us an insight about some kind of interesting duality of what information does in the world. So let's get a bit more concrete. Let's talk about informational invariance. So informational invariance um, of decision making um, I mean that we can actually make hard statements about what you need to do in decision making. And I mentioned Ashby earlier, was one of the few people who did in the early cybernetics some success, had some success with information theory. So his statement was only variety can destroy variety. There's an extension and refinement by Jushet and Lloyd, dates to 2000, 2004. And essentially, you look at an open loop controller. So there is a world, and the world proceeds, and you have a blind agent. And the, let's assume that this agent, uh, think of it as like a Hoover. Um, it's blind, but it sucks in dirt, and it just happens to do it. So as suck, it sucks in dirt, reduces entropy, reduces the disorder in the environment. <clears throat> now, yet we look at the most re entropy-reducing open-loop controller you can imagine, and look at the entropy reduction it can achieve. So delta H star open, it's the best entry reduction an open loop controller can possibly achieve in this world. And now we ask what happens if we permit this agent to have a look at the world. We add a sensor and ask how much better can we get. So this is now the closed loop entropy reduction. And it turns out that this closed entropy loop reduction is limited by what the open loop controller can do at best, plus the information the agent action can get about the agent, the world state. So having a sensor means that at most this amount more entropy reduction can be achieved. At most. It could happen that you don't get anything extra. So this is an upper limit. In general, it doesn't have to be that high. <clears throat> so it, it is the open loop reduction plus possibly some more, but never more than this. This is a law of mathematics. It's not a law of physics. It's a mathematical law. It's always valid. Sometimes we can make that even sharper. So let's look at the following scenario. I have a little lab navigational task. There's an agent here sitting on this grid. And this agent has four sensors, or actually one sensor that gives it the direction of the highest uh, uh, gradient value. So for example, here, have a value here, 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 and here, and the brightest value is the highest amount of chemical. So if the gradient points down, the agent will go down. There are only four directions, and there are only four actions. So this gradient is simply a gradient follower, 
if there are two directions with equally uh, equally high, it will pick one randomly, and it will move to the center. And because there is no stop action, once it reaches the center, it will wobble around. Okay. So when we start the agent at in a in an area here, this agent lives in a space with entropy. As it proceeds, it reduces the entropy and reaches the center. So it has squeezed out the entropy of the original state to re almost zero. It's not exactly zero because it is wobbling around, but it's it's very minor. And now we can write that again as a Bayesian network. Uh, there's a world, there's a dedicated sensor, actuator, memory we don't need. So let's get rid of it. And now we can ask, okay, how much information did the agent process as it started from its playground somewhere around the center and moved to the center. And if you look, um, this was the initial state, say, um, and then we see the censoring value at the first step, second step, third step, fourth step, and so on as it goes to infinity. As we look at the sensor history, it turns out that the information that sensor history had about the original state approaches the total entropy at the beginning. Now, this is not trivial. It's not obvious. It doesn't have to happen. In this case, it does happen because we have a conservative system. So if the agent does not get any direction by its own actions, it will just do a random walk and will float out to infinity. It will not get to the center. Certainly, it will not stay there. So in other words, it turns out that it is an invariant. The agent must process the total amount of information that was in its original uncertainty it must process it throughout its run. Otherwise, if you can't do that, it will not be able to reach the center. It will not be able to squeeze out the ultimate amount of entropy. So we have a conservation law here of information. Conservation of information. Um, I, I like to say this way, there's no perpetuum mobile of the third kind. For those of you who, who know perpetuum mobile, are machines that run forever. So um, originally people thought you could generate work out of nothing, out of thin air. This was perpetual mobile of first kind. Then people thought, okay, this is not possible, energy conservation. But yeah, you can take um, um, uh, hot hot air, you land land on Venus, and it will extract energy out of no temperature differences. That's not possible either. It's perpetual mobile of second kind. But here we have a third kind one. You can't generate information out of nothing. If you need information to solve a problem, you need that information. This is not physics. This is not about Landauer limits. This is math. This works on high-level systems, systems far away from any thermodynamic limits. OK? This is hard. However, the news is not quite as bad. Um, sometimes, well, while, while there may not be no, be no free lunch, sometimes there is free beer. That is something I'm happy to discuss with you in the question. Uh, hour because I don't have time to talk about this here. Let me just summarize. Here we have the entropy of W0 determines the minimum amount of information that you need to process to get to the center. The interesting part now is, while that is an invariant, you can choose how you distribute it. It can be spread over time. In our case, it's spread over time. It's taken by the sensor one by one. The agent never has a full memory of the full full uh, system. It just remembers what it just saw in the sensor right now. Sensors and memory, you can spread it out differently in sensors and memory, and you could also spread it through other agents. Note, this invariance is purely entropic. We don't care actually about the task. We talk only about the entropy of the goal state. As we go through specific tasks, let me move on to the next level. So I'm sure Oscar Wilde would be delighted to live in our times, and I'm sure he would be an influencer of great renown. And of course, this statement is uh, truer today than ever. It is a very sad thing that nowadays there is so little useless information. I think uh, he really preempted the internet. Um, so as we go for decision making, of course, we all know how to make model decision making. I will talk about MDPs, Markov decision problems now. I'm not going to talk about the POMDPs. But essentially, so we assume that we have an agent that can, in principle, access the full world. So I'm merging W and S. 
I pretend that the sensor in principle could be the whole world, and I extract a policy that decides what I'm doing for the next step. So this is our Bayesian network, slightly simplified. We have a utility that we optimize. This is our usual utility. We are uh, basically collecting rewards as we go. Now, our task is find the best policy pi star. This is the standard MVP problem. But the standard reinforcement learning doesn't care about decision costs. The decision costs are free. I mean, you, you can have a policy as complicated as you want. Of course, there are all kinds of regularization, sometimes ad hoc, sometimes a bit more principle. But here we want a regularization that really expresses the fact that information processing is expensive in biology. So we would in include the information cost itself and expand to an IMDP. And what exactly do I mean here? Here I mean a very special uh, type of information parsimony. We minimize the relevant information, the information that the action extracts from the state or the sensor at a given utility level. So the utility level can be optimal. That's the best you can do, but it could be also below that. So formally, um, it's a classic Lagrangian formalism. Don't be afraid of the formula. I'll explain the terms very quickly. So we minimize this. And to model the fact that we choose um, an expected utility, um, here we write this term and multiply with beta. And this beta is controlling how optimal we want the system to be. So if beta goes to infinity, essentially you say, I want optimal behavior. Amongst all optimal behaviors, I want to choose the policies with minimum information cost. If it's not unique. If it's unique, well, there's just one. But if it's not unique, I want the minimum information cost policy. If beta goes to zero, it's the opposite. I want a policy where the information is low, so open loop, blind. And amongst all policies, which are zero information policies, I want the ones that have the least, uh, the least uh, value, uh, the, the, the highest value, sorry. So I want the ones that have the highest value. So I want the highest value for open loop policies. And beta between these values is simply something in between. So let's look at how that looks here. I have a nice little example. Let me just check the time very quickly. OK, yeah, we're good enough. Sorry about that. Um, so um, I have basically two goals, A and B. And uh, in this grid world, I can go north, east, south, and west. And I get a penalty of minus one for each step. So I want to make this route short. It's very clear A has a longer average route because it's in the corner than B. So B has a slightly higher value than A. And now we can look at uh, the trade-off of utility versus relevant information. How does it look like? Here we have the function. This is the relevant information, how much information you need. And this is the value, the average value you get. So let's look at A first. A was in the corner, remember, so it takes a bit longer to get there. The best you can do on average is minus 10.5 on average. So minus 10.5 is the optimal case. It's the highest value you can, this is the red curve for A, is the highest value you, you can achieve um, with a, with, with, uh, for a goal A. And the relevant information you need to do that is relatively small. It's less than 0.2 bits per step because essentially you have only to distinguish whether you're in the center somewhere. You see the wall, the north wall, the east wall, or you don't see them. There are three different things you have to do. And while you're in the middle, you basically, uh, you can take any action north or east. As you make the agent use less and less information, so you squeeze the information out, the value goes down. <clears throat> and here you have a blind policy, an open loop policy, which is essentially not that much worse. And the reason for that is that you can just go north or east and proceed randomly because the walls act as a funnel to push you into the corner so the walls don't give you an extra penalty just time penalty as usual if you bang on the wall you just you lose time they're not electrified it's okay to bump into walls it doesn't hurt you uh, beyond the loss of time however when we look at b then the best we can do with b we see this is 
minus 5.5. Of course, B is closer to every other point. If you have an optimal policy, you will get a value of minus 5.5. But look at the information. It's huge. It's 1.2 bits per step. And the reason for that is that at each decision, we have to decide, am I above this point, below this point, or at the right level? You essentially need a GPS to find it. The corner is far easier to find. So you see that here, the agent has to expend much more effort to get to the center. It has to spend a lot more information processing for this goal. The corner goal is far easier. And that is what I meant by free beer, right? So sometimes the world is helpful to you. And you, as an agent, are tem tempted, of course, to pick goals that makes it easier for you and informationally cheaper to get a goal. In fact, when we made the agent blind, in the case of B, the value goes really down to around minus 200. The reason is, in that case, essentially, you have no chance but actually a random walk to find the center. So this is summarizing it, and I'll now move on to the next point. I want now to say, why would you actually ever want to be suboptimal? Is there just saving energy and time? Well, I just want to just give a glimpse on something that Matt um, already indicated um, uh, two days ago. Uh, namely, the question is, uh, if we overlearn, we have only one goal, we see only one goal, then, then our agent becomes blinkered. And essentially, um, similar things happen if you just look at perfectly optimal behavior. And I want to convince you that sometimes less is more. So here's just the diagram. There's no math here involved, but essentially it can be done mathematically. And think of it if you have an optimal agent. An optimal agent always acts optimally. So think of it as a mountain landscape. And the mountain landscape is covered by fog. So you have no idea what's out there. And you don't care because you're always acting the right thing. All you know about your world of actions, all you know are these four optimal spots. You have no idea how the world looks beside that. So you have no generalization capability. You have no knowledge of the world outside of these optimal spots. As we remove the clouds, we see there's much more there. And this is what happens when you become suboptimal. When you're suboptimal, you have to live with the fact that you have to pick suboptimal actions. Then you need to know what the suboptimal sub actions look like. And therefore, you can, by reducing beta, you can explore and you're forced to explore how the world looks outside of its optimality. This is one reason also why sometimes robustness depends on suboptimal solutions. Being suboptimal is not always a bad thing. I will skip this one because um, I wanted to show you a couple of other things. Let me just... Um, so, I, I want to, first of all, to show you one uh, result. It's actually quite an old result by now, but it still uh, shows you that uh, if, with information you can do quite, quite a, a, a fun things that are biologically interesting. And uh, here's this uh, fantastic quote by Ludwig Wittgenstein. Problems are solved not by giving new information, but by arranging what we have known since long. Again, I, I'm hailing back to the you know, yesterday by Xiao Ping, um, that essentially you get all kinds of information, but in the end of the day, you ask, okay, which information do I actually want? And sometimes it's actually knowing how to organize your information that what matters. So here's uh, the, the test, the, the, the experiment that we did. We took an IBO. This is these old Sony robotic dog. Uh, they were discontinued for a time, but came back, I think, in, into, um, uh, into uh, sale. And so here sits this Ivo, watches a book, and then uh, gets some, some information from the environment. And now let's assume that some nasty, nasty circumstances caused the Ivo to rewire its eyes. And um, basically, it wakes up, and its eyes are completely disorganized. So this was its retina, and after, the disorganization looks like that. Poor Ivo. Can we do something? So this is a disorganized eye. This is what it saw in the original. And this is a reconstruction. How does reconstruction work? You look at the information distance between two pixels. 
and you look at the streams arriving through the movement of the of the agent and as this movement arises then you basically try to put pixels in close by that have a similar uh, uh, are informationally close to each other and now let, let me see whether i can actually make this um, work or whether it's a little bit slower than um, than usual okay clearly it's ah something is happening everything takes five times longer I'm sorry about that This is because of the screen share. My apologies. Um, I'm afraid that being being on on uh, on the screen share seems to very slow down things very considerably. Okay, I think I think that takes too much time, so I will skip that one and return to the slides, which also takes time. I see now a cloud of a thousand people waiting for <laughs> for this to move. Um, right. Okay. So so basically, what we what you see is essentially that this um, field reorganizes and. It will adapt each other, itself back in, into the order, into the into the neighborhood that it actually um, um, so that nearby pixels will essentially be mapped nearby just by looking at the information distance between the pixels. So here is another one that uh, is, is a movie that I, I try to show, but um, I, I don't think I can. I will skip the show. I'll just explain what to do here. We took the, all the sensors of the IBO plus a selection of the visual field, plus a selection of the visual field of 100 sensors, and essentially did the same game again when you run this and look at the information distance between these different sensor streams. It arranges itself into a bipartite, uh, uh, into, into um, uh, um, a bilaterally symmetric um, map topographic sensory topic map of the different sensors with a very clear separate region for the eye you see here the vestiges of that unfortunately i can't run it but here you see the legs the left leg the right leg and a couple of other things the things in the center are the things that are hard to separate they don't have very correct uh, um, uh, correlations here there's another example this is the famous example um, by daw um, and uh, William Wiesel, essentially, where you put uh, an IBO in an impoverished environment where there are only vertical bars, and it actually degenerates its sensory streams into these linear groups. Unlike the poor cats in the experiments, you can undo that by putting the IBO back into an enriched environment. So this works. Um, so I would like, in the last minute of the talk, um, to talk about universal utilities a bit. We talked about, OK, uh, the rewards, and people think, OK, reward is just there. But of course, we know that, that organisms don't have clear reward. It's not clear what rewards would be, what tasks would be. Tasks are not well defined in, in biology in general. So the success criterion is survival, viability, effectively. And the search space is huge. And it's very sparse and it's very large. So lots of things you can do wrong. In short, um, if you really talk in the spirit of pure Darwinism, 
Ähm, Uh, the reactions are very slow on the screen. I apologize for that. Basically, in pure Darwinism, feedback is by death. If you get it all right, and then before you procreate, you make a mistake, you're dead. That's your feedback. It's a very, very nasty feedback. The question is, can we do better? We know that homeostasis creates a uh, lot of dense networks that guide living beings. But these networks are organism-specific and designed on case-to-case -case basis for artificial agents. Well, not designed, evolved, right? And if you if you if you if you um, have an artificial agent, it's designed for an organism. Uh, it's, it's specific to the organism. The question is, can you do better than that? So the idea, and I will just give a very short outline of that: that if you have adaptational feedback that tells you what to do, this feedback must be dense. So you need to get it all the time to be useful, and not just once in a, in a long period. And it should be rich. It should tell you, to a good extent, what you're doing wrong, right? If it's not rich, it's very, very hard to learn. So it should tell you, well, if I just stretch your elbow too far, it hurts. You know, this is the elbow. You should not stretch your elbow. It's not your knee. It's not your head. It's your elbow. So it should be rich. And there are quite a few ideas that have popped up in the last decades. Artificial Curiosity by Schmidt Huber, Learning Progress by Kaplan Ubi, Totalic Principle by Steels and the intrinsic rewards by Singh and many, many others. And probably a bit closer to what we are talking about here is uh, some, some aspects of the free energy principle, uh, the homeokinesis by Rolf there, and predictive information, which is an information theoretic variant of homeokinesis. Um, also ideas from physics, like cause and tropic forcing have been suggested. And th this is probably closest in, uh, to, to what, what I'm talking about here. The answers we had is informational impedance match. Optimize informational fit into the sensory motor niche. So maximize the potential to inject information to the environment and recapture it. This is an evolutionary strong reason to do. Let me, in, uh, let me just highlight how, how to read it. You are in control of your destiny as an organism. And being in control is good. And knowing it is good. You need to know it. It's not enough to just be in control of the destiny. You need to know it. So basically, it's formally the mixture of controllability and observability. And this can be formulated in an information theoretical way, so our famous perception action loop. I'll cut off the memory, we don't need it. I cut off the sensing and acting loop, we well, don't need it. And basically, I look at actions. I do an action, I choose it, Time passes. I do a second action. Something happens. Time passes. I do a third action. Again, everything is blind except for the starting state. I know where, where I'm starting here. Right? So I have done three actions, and now I look, what have I done? What has happened? And I now look at the effect that my actions have on this final sensory state. Not necessarily on the world. It's, it's actually subjective. It's what I can observe about the changes of the world. And I maximize that influence. This maximum influence is measured by mutual information. So how much can these actions influence my sensory state? Maximize that. Now I'll make a little modification. This depends actually on the starting state. It depends on actually where I started, right? So it becomes a function of the world state. And I simplify anyway. So this is this maximum influence from this actions to this state starting in the given state. And this thing we call empowerment. How much influence do you have over your future world? It's not what you do, it's only your influence. And as an organism, you want to move to states that maximize your influence. So I don't have time to go too much into details, but basically it's a utility, pseudo utility. It's purely defined by the world dynamics and you don't need a reward. So it, it emerges in the moment you have an agent. Let me just give you a couple of examples. So here is a very simple one. And this is a little room. There's a, a maze, maze, basically. And the black areas are where this value of empowerment is very high. So where in five steps, I can no, this is one step, two steps, five steps, and 10 steps. So basically, the darker this is, the further I can get um, in, in the, uh, starting the state in the scale given here. So the scales are not the same. Otherwise, you can't see much. So essentially here I get 
uh, all these states are hard to distinguish here, can distinguish very clearly the central states from the boundary states. And even with just one step, there's a clear preference for states in the middle of the room to states in the corner or in the corridor. So um, I have another example that's a pendulum, but I suspect this pendulum, um, I can't run it. So what you have to imagine, this is an acrobat. It is a relatively difficult, um, um, or it used to be a difficult reinforcement learning path. Um, but with empowerment, you can even just using empowerment locally, it's not a reinforcement learning algorithm. You can drive the agent to maximize its empowerment. Turns out that standing up and balancing it upright is the most part because then I can make very little changes and have this pendulum fall down as opposed to being down where I have to work very hard to make it do anything, right? So empowerment makes you balance. It finds that balancing is a preferable situation because you can control, you have a precarious state that your agent can control. Think of it precariousness. Some people thought this is a met, uh, uh, indicator of life and um, or, or a hallmark of life. And so in that case, an empowerment measures this precariousness, controllable precariousness. So I want to hope, uh, let's, I want to show you, I have this Pac-Man thing where uh, I can show using empowerment, but since we're coming to the end, I'll just save time and I, while I talk, I will show you a couple of examples which I like best. This is basically um, uh, in the Minecraft type scenario where you can move, build, destroy blocks, and essentially um, these blocks um, can be transferred. And here we have a little agent that can, has a river of lava. And as this river of lava is blocking the agent's path, the agent cannot go into the lava. It can cross it only if a bridge is built. And um, if the movie appears, which seems not to be the case, it probably will appear in half an hour, um, it actually builds a bridge for the agent. We lost you lost the audio? For a little bit. You lost? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. But okay. You have uh, four more minutes just to also say that. Yeah, okay. So then I'll just wrap up the movie doesn't seem to appear. So essentially, oh well, there you go. So the agent will cross build a bridge over the lava. Um, the other two examples, it's just too slow, I, I, I can't show it. So the other two examples, uh, other three examples are basically the agent. Okay, this is the, so it's not very useful. Um, the other, other, the other three examples are a, the agent essentially um, being swamped in an overflowing lava world is basically, uh, it's not a climate change, basically lava is overflowing. And the agent has uh, finds three different strategies. They they emerge randomly, so there are different probabilities for them to emerge. One and one, the agent reacts very late. It's uh, like a typical politician builds a little island, jumps on the island uh, to escape the lava. And uh, this in this one, uh, the agent builds dam effectively to block the lava. And the third one is is actually the one I like best. In that case, the agent actually digs in and builds in sub cavernous sub uh, subterranean uh, dwelling. Uh, to escape the lava and it corks the it corks the entrance so the lava can't enter so in other words the agent has discovered a way to uh, survive and with this i will close the presentation for now but i'm happy to answer questions at this time right so right so you so have a few questions, few questions. Um, the um, first one, the, first one uh, the most, uh, votes, the most is... votes is how can you How use can such you knowledge use such to describe a fractal model, model. Uh, besides of using Kullback, Leibniz, uh, divergence as the cost function? Okay. Can, can you repeat the question? So, yeah. How can you use such knowledge you described in a practical model uh, besides using Kullback, Leibniz, divergence as the cost function? I don't know where the practical model might come down to Robocop, like a software playing agent. How can you make them work better? Um, okay, so you need a model in the end. If you do, for example, empowerment, you need a forward model. I'm not saying where it comes from, right? This model needs to be learned. But um, the reason I showed the example with a, with a, um, a sensor re map reconstruction is that even using information theory, you sometimes can create some 
aspects of a model, reconstruct some aspects, geometric aspects, structural aspects, just by looking at the informational correlation between variables. Okay, so the the the, the cool the cool part is that you can't say exactly where your model assumptions come in. Of course, you can just use a neural network for that. In fact, you can. Um, there are strong uh, strong suspicions that in forward you can use feed forward networks and deep networks to model things like bottleneck and and similar similar um, uh, information theoretical models. It's perfectly fine. Yeah, so we don't really um, have an opinion about uh, where the model comes from. It's just in information theory, you can say very precisely this is what the model assumption is. Yeah. I don't know whether I'm answering the question. Uh, well, since I didn't originally ask it, we can actually in, in the Q and A session later on today we could ask and invite this uh, questioner on screen and get some more insight. If, if I could squeeze in a quick question of my own and had to do with empowerment, uh, which uh, basically seems to me like maximal impact on the environment would be like blowing things up. So that that doesn't seem to be that useful. No, it's not that you do it. It means you can. So empowerment says, how much could I do? I, I had I had one example, um, um, money. With a lot of money, you can create a lot of trouble, right? Yeah, uh, if, if you're a billionaire, you can create a lot of trouble, you know that. The point is, do you actually spend it on this? Doesn't mean you do it, right? You oh, could spend okay. it on the party, you could spend it on this, or you just keep it. You, you're like Uncle Scrooge, he doesn't even spend the money. Just could spend it. So empowerment is like that. Uh, oh, in okay. fact, when you want to do something, what you do, you exchange empowerment for some other goal. Ultimately, okay. if you don't live forever, your empowerment will disappear. So essentially, you need to spend it, spend your empowerment coins, your coin of the realm, if you like. Uh, if I quote Matt here, uh, you have to spend it. Right, and then we had a question that's back to your example, which was asking, isn't the wall giving information in the case of the corner position? If you start at the corner with your is the I'm right while um, giving information um so uh yes 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 this is exactly what happens it does it does give information but to my knowledge this is not well understood how how to model this right because um uh, the the separation of the contributions of what the agent does and what the wall does is not easy and in fact if you, you can ask uh, joe lisier he knows everything about that um the, the the separation of informational contributions is a far more intricate question than looks on first sight. So people have tried to say how much information for me, how much information for me. Let's try to separate it. There was this absolutely ingenious uh, insight by Paul Williams and Randall Beer uh, that you actually have a much finer structure of information than the standard Shannon Venn diagram. But but turns out it's not that easy. It turns out it's a very very intricate question and. Uh, uh, a large community, it, it, not that large community, but it keeps the community occupied very strongly for now almost 10 years. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure um, the workshop by Joe will cover some of these points. Okay, and one final question I think we have time for, uh, and also want to let you know there was lots of applause there on the right side um, in the chat. But the last question then that we have time for now, uh, and then there's another Q&A in six hours. Um, does continually seeking uh, dense information without acting on the environment, in parentheses in printing, will result in increased entropy inside the brain? And no, I mean, you, you do learn, right? You want to know, um, do I, I do something and it's wrong, and, and I need to somehow to get this, this feedback and that it's wrong. Now, if you have a sensor like hunger and thirst and, and pain, these are very elementary sensors. So. You will damage your body if you ignore them. Um, so these are hard, hardcore, hardwired. But there are many things where you don't know exactly what your world is like, and you have lots of uh, different things that you don't know. Shall I do this? Shall I do that? It's not really clear. And in these cases, when it's not obvious what to avoid, um, then basically, um, then empowerment or perhaps similar quantities are useful because then you select amongst indifferent things, things that are more interesting as compared to things that are less interesting. By the way, 
um, if you have superpowers or, or gods, I, I call it a tragedy of the Greek gods, it can do too much. For them, the landscape looks completely even everywhere. So they're bored. That's exactly why we like avatars in games. We like to actually improve our capabilities in games because it structures our space. Okay, with that Thank word you, about the gods, um, we need to uh, finish. There's an 18 minute coffee break and a rest break coming up. And then there's a, the next featured presentation. So please uh, stay on or resign for that. And thank you, Daniel, so much for an enlightening talk about information. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. And I will end this session here. <laughs>